see like a pop up saying, yeah, that we're using a third party. So the meeting is now streaming live. So we're good. Okay. We, let me just, yeah, it says we're streaming. All right. What's up, everybody? Coming to you live again. Um, for those of you who did not hear the news on the last um, live talk we did, Colleen has purchased Modern Yoga, yoga teacher. And so we are, uh, you know, it, it felt like it was time to to put some some talks out, some content and, and really get for y'all to get to know Colleen. Um, talk about, uh, in particular today, the biggest mistakes that yoga teachers make in their careers. Now, of course, we won't be able to cover all of them, but we're going to cover the kind of the most frequently made mistakes in the yoga teacher journey. And there is quite a bit of them. Um, I, I will say that as yoga teachers, often we kind of put sometimes yoga in a box. We think it should be this. We think our guru should be this. And uh, it takes a while for us to sometimes unlearn some of these patterns and realize that uh, we really have to sometimes think outside the box and be willing to try things that make us maybe feel uncomfortable. And uh, I think what one of the core things that we want to share is that marketing, sales, and um, you know, talking to people to then roll them into your program or whatever it may be, these things are just about building a relationship. It's not about manipulation. It's not about Jedi mind tricks. It's just about how can you build your your audience and how can you build your clientele? And you have to be able to speak to people about it. So um, it's one of my favorite topics because I just think back on my journey and all the mistakes that I made. Colleen, I'm sure you can draw from the mistakes that you've made over the last decade as a yoga teacher. So let's keep it light. We'll keep it fun, but also informational at the same time. And again, Colleen, you know, congratulations again. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right way to say it. But uh, for, you know, stepping up into the, the ownership of Modern Yoga Teacher. And so do you want to start us off talking about some of the biggest mistakes that yoga teachers make? Sure. I love this. Ryan, thank you very much. Um, I know that uh, after our last call, we had a little conversation. You were like, biggest mistakes yoga teachers make. And you started list listing all these things off. I'm like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did all of that. Um, and, and then you were sharing with me about the, the reason that you started Modern Yoga Teacher as a way to like completely avoid that. And so today I was guest teaching for another yoga teacher training as the anatomy instructor. And someone said, do you have any advice? And I, I teach this a lot in my business program. So what, as well as like pick your path is what I've always called it. And before you start making your offerings, it's very clear, but like, make sure you know who you're offering to, right? Mm -hmm. So once you've decided that, this, it not only helps you with your ideal client and your marketing, but it also helps you with your time and your energy and your money, right? So one of the biggest mistakes I made was when I left nursing and med school, it was because I was bringing in a significant amount of money teaching kids yoga. So if I was to pick my path, it would be kids yoga. But here I am taking meditation teacher training, I'm taking yin teacher training, and my focus was all over the place to try to get as many people as I could into all the different programs that I had going on. Workshops, privates, teacher trainings, retreats, like whatever it is that I could offer I was. And I would say that that definitely contributed to some burnout. Sure. I mean, if you think about it, if you go through a 200 hour teacher training, you know, 99.99% of the audience more about yoga than they do. But for some reason, I actually think that this comes from a place of I'm not enough. So we go out and we get more education. We're getting, so we're like, I need to validate myself. I need to get this because I need to have all this knowledge. And if I have all this knowledge, then I'll be enough and I'll be able to like really stand on my own two feet. And the reality, again, is that when you go through a 200-hour teacher training, that is enough knowledge for you to stand on your own two feet and incorporate that into your life. Just don't go from training to training to training to training to training. I'm not saying that every person who goes out and gets a lot of training is, is thinking down deep they're not enough. But I would venture to say that there's many of them, including myself, 
you know, that felt that, whether it was a, on a conscious level or unconscious level. And, you know, the, the, we're going to, uh, this is not going to be linear, y'all. It's not. We're just going to throw out some things that, uh, you know, you're going to find in your yoga teacher journey. But a lot of yoga teachers that got their 200 hour, they're like, oh, I want to do this full time. I really want to do, I want to be a teacher. I want to work more. I want this to be more a part of my career. And so like, oh, I've got to go get my 500 hour thinking somehow magically that's going to make you not only a better teacher, but then also you're going to be able to make more money and you're going to have all these, you're going to have more knowledge, no doubt. And you probably will be a better teacher because you're putting your focus and your efforts. And often when you go into teacher training, you have to teach in order to complete that certification. So, but are you really learning how to get more clients? Are you really learning how to talk to them? Are you really learning how to present what it is that you teach? Are you really honing in on what you love to teach and to be able to convey that to other people? And so I remember I, I created like a Facebook ad a little while back and I was like, I was like, okay, I'm a yoga teacher. So I get my 200 hour yoga teacher training. And then I go to 15 different studios with my resume trying to get in because hard to get into any studio these days. So I start teaching a couple group classes. Yay. And then I love it. I like it. So I want to do more of it. And I'm like, I want to do this for a career. So I go out and I can try to get five, 10, 15 additional classes per week so I can do this work. And then you know what? I got to do workshops because that's a way to make more money. And I got to do one-on-ones. And then maybe, you know, five years from now, three years from now, I can start teaching retreats. And that's another way of making money. <laughs> and then after that, then maybe within another few years, I can do teacher trainings and I can lead those. And that's a way for me to, to actually sustain myself financially. You have just put yourself in six to seven different directions. You know, I, I have no, I did that. I used to teach 15 to 22 classes per week and I bartend on the side just so I could literally try to survive. And I still only made like two grand at $2,500 a month. You know, I, I went from being in the mortgage business and trying to accumulate wealth and real estate and all this stuff. And then I lost everything in 2008. So I was like, you know what? Screw going after this wealth. I'm going to go after something that I love. So I became a full-time yoga teacher. And I was more than willing to go through the steps of, you know, working my way up, not only getting more group classes, but also like trying to work and create more revenue. But it was, it was tough. It was tough for a really long time, you know, and I resisted bringing in the sales and marketing from my previous, you know, careers because that was less than, that was corporate -y. And I didn't want that to touch the pure part of my life. And so that's another big mistake that I think yoga teachers make is that maybe their parents had an unhealthy relationship with money. Maybe they've had, you know, some suffering around money. And so when it comes to the yoga part of things, when you start thinking about making more money, it maybe doesn't feel in alignment. But the reality is it's not money that is the issue. It's your experience with money. So part of that is also you coming to peace. Again, I'm, I'm a little all over the place, so stay with me. So when people would go through my our program, the Yoga Mastermind, and Colleen, by the way, is going to do something very special with that program. Um, I won't take away her thunder, but let's just <laughs> say that if you continue to be a part of this audience, you are going to greatly benefit. I'll just say that. She's coming out of the gate swinging. So um, a lot of people, when they would go through our program, our mastermind program, they would often, you know, they would go through and they would do everything step by step. And in the beginning of that program, I didn't have anything around beliefs and around mindset. There was a little bit, but not a tremendous amount. So people would go through the program and then they were they're like, I'm not experiencing the success that I thought I would experience. And almost every single time we were able to draw it back to a belief. So what we put in the mastermind was before you go on and you start thinking about your niche and your perfect client, what are all the things that, what are beliefs that you have around money? What are the beliefs that you have around success? What are the beliefs around marketing, sales, charging two to 8,000 per client? Because that's what we were teaching, creating a signature program. 
And we wanted un to uncover things that were no longer serving them. And for me, when I thought of money, I thought of it was unsustainable to be rich because like you were, I thought that you meant you had to be materialistic. I thought that meant you had to be rude and greedy. And because of that, of course, I'm not going to have money come into my life. And if it is, it's going to be for a short, very short period. So if you do finally say, you know what, I'm going to grow my yoga business, but you haven't come to peace with money or you've got beliefs around that or around sales, or around marketing. Even if you follow the one, two, three success manual, you're going to find a way to fuck it up. Because in your mind, you don't believe that you deserve success or whatever or money is bad or success means you got to screw people over. So it's looking at this from a holistic perspective of let's heal. Let's uncover these things that are no longer serving you that don't really actually probably not even true before we get into the business side of things. And so I think that's the, the biggest mistake I made. And I was perpetuating it for our clients in the beginning because I wasn't honoring that they needed to get these beliefs. They needed to get these things out. And the other thing they did was write down all the beliefs of why you will be successful as a yoga teacher and in this program, and then write all the reasons why you think you will not. A lot of people are like, why would I write down all the reasons I don't think I'm going to be successful? Because you need to uncover that bullshit. You need to let it go. See, now that Colleen owns the company, I can cuss more. So this, this is, this is going to happen. <laughs> be forewarned. But Colleen, back to you. Did that, did that bring up anything for you? Yeah, so, so much. You know, the there's this term called spiritual bypassing. I'm sure you're aware of it. <laughs> spiritual materialism. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time um, with my own integrity and also lots of research and books. Um, and when you were talking about like imposter syndrome or not being enough, um, one of the things that I notice is very prominent in the spiritual community, the medicine community included, is this act of, of spiritual bypassing. You know, when people come into 200 hour teacher training, they're so excited because you're learning all these beautiful insights and, and, and ideas about yourself. And it's so incredible. And then uh, I want more, I want more. <laughs> But like, what's going to happen that you're actually going to get more is to take the tools that you learn and, and bring them into your life, implement and integrate, right? But I don't see that happening. I see people going home and they're like, oh my gosh, I got to do the next training because I need more insights and I need to understand more about myself. But the reality is now you're just teaching from like books. What would it look like to integrate, to take time, to take the tools, to meditate every day? to practice yoga, like you're telling people they should, and then teach from a place of experience, not take that next course, not take all of your time, energy, and money just to like do more and more and more. Because also I think society-wise, it is all about doing more. Otherwise you're lazy. Oh, and when it comes to the, uh, go ahead. No, 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 please continue. Well, when it comes to the materialism aspect, you know, I'll have a lot of people come to me and say, Oh, but wait, like in, you know, like in order to be spiritual, you have to be broke. Listen to Sutra, blah, 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 around attachment. And I'm like, okay, I mean, okay. One of the things that can create a big argument is having people translate things for you. So I don't want to translate it for you, but what I, wa I want to do is tell you what I hear when I hear about attachment. You know, when you own something, it owns you. I'm thinking about you personally, you're about to move and you have a lot of belongings and you're like, what do I do? Because if I come back, Whoa, I don't want to buy new look, stuff. I have very few belongings. Let's just okay, say I, I can fit everything into a like 10 by 10 storage room. So like, it's okay. not a lot. I, 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 I pride myself. So that's why like, because <laughs> I all my possessions used to fit in my truck uh, up to about a year ago. All my possessions like fit inside my truck and I don't like a lot of possessions. It's just not my thing. Okay. Anyways, let's, let's get back to the regular schedule. Program. Right. Yes. <laughs> like, wait. The, the idea I'm saying here is like, if you have those possessions, period, you have to come back for them. So as you, I don't want to give away like all your stuff that I know personally, but as you journey off, there is like a need to return based on the fact that you have stuff in your home or in your storage unit or wherever it is. And that's kind of 
that's my interpretation of the attachment of stuff. Whatever you own owns you. And so if you have stuff, it keeps you like, it, it does kind of restrict you a bit. When I moved, I did have some stuff still when I sold everything, um, but I didn't have to be anywhere. And so when I didn't know, when people would be like, when's your journey ending? Because I came to Costa Rica, I'm like, I don't know. Like I literally had nothing holding me to anything. And that was my experience of letting go of materialism. And, and then again, what I do know is the reason I sold everything is because I had acquired it so quickly. Like here we are in my home where I have a bunch of stuff again. It was so quick to come back into my life as soon as I had one spot to settle in. It's, it's amazing, which is why I, that's my understanding of like this stuff comes and goes. It doesn't mean I have to be broke and it doesn't mean I don't have to have a home or a bed. <laughs> well, to, to relate that to what we're talking about in terms of the, the yoga career is that um, I think what happens is we have this, this romance. We have this vision of like what yoga is going to be. And what, and this is the same thing. So think about, think about a relationship. You think about that person in the beginning and it's all lovey dovey. And then the, the real starts kicking in. The real, real starts kicking in. It's the same thing with yoga, y'all. There's the real, real. The real, real is you got to pay your freaking mortgage. You got to pay your rent. <laughs> the real, real is you got to make your car payment. You are not a swami sitting on the corner collecting money from the local community in order for you to teach yoga. That's not the way it works. We've, we, we, we live in a different so a time now. And I know you all know this, but it's just like sometimes we need to I need to like state the obvious and state it a little bit in your face to you. So you're like, yeah, he's right. And that's the thing is that we have this love for yoga and it's something that's it's the in some ways the pure part of our life. And so because of things that we've had a bad, bad experience with or just experience our perception of what these things are, we don't want that to touch yoga. And that often is the marketing, that is the business, that is the actually the sales part of things. And the reality is, is that, you know, if somebody, if you have the solution to someone's suffering, you have a freaking responsibility to share the solution with them. Think about that. Stop talking and, and, and mulling over like, I don't want to talk about, I, I don't want to ask for something. I don't want to like, oh, this makes me uncomfortable. You have the solution to that person's problem. And so you have an obligation to share it with them. And that's the way, like, you, you, listen, I understand that there's growing pains when it comes to you starting your business and you're going off on your own. And there's a lot of different responsibilities and not everybody can do it. One of the best things I think I've learned in business is to tell people that something's going to be difficult because there's so many jackasses who are just out there saying like, you just don't need to, you just need to like, you know, you don't have to have a brain cell. You don't have to like, you know, commit to a little bit of time and effort and you can be rich and all this other bullshit. And the reality is, is that people actually trust you when you tell them it's going to be hard. And the reason that I, that I, 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 it's not because I'm a genius that I figured that out. It was literally Peloton bikes exploded over the last 10 years and they had a, like a marketing document that was released like leaked and that was one of their core concepts was to say that this is hard why because you attract people who are within willing to put in the hard work to get the benefits that you want them to have and because you're actually scaring the people that you don't want to work with away that are not going to get benefits from the product then you have a higher success rate for the people who do. This is why we tell you to get clear on who your perfect client is, because that person is going to take your information and get the most results from it. The other people who are not meant to be your perfect client, they're going to detract away from your perfect client. That's why we say a rotten apple will spoil the bunch. The biggest freaking mistake that I made with modern yoga teacher, y'all, was I didn't have the courage to speak to who I wanted to serve. I, I wouldn't have the courage to say, this is really freaking, like I said it towards the end, but I would say this is for yoga teachers, meditation instructors, those who use yoga as a, some form of, you know, in their healing practice. And I was like, yeah, come on in. If I was to say it now, I'd be like, listen, 
This is only for those who are willing to put in some real hard work, who not only know this is your calling, but you will do what it takes. And when it gets difficult, you will keep putting one foot in front of the other, because no matter what you do, it's going to be difficult. Go ahead, Colleen. I, I'm getting emotional here, so please. One of my, my first coach to, uh, told me, how you do anything is how you do everything. And it hit me in a way that I said, no, no, wait. Like I do things different for different situations. But then, I mean, her core concept was your sales or your spiritual practice. And so when we, I started to look at how I conduct my sales, because we would watch my sales together after doing it, which was like embarrassing, even more embarrassing than doing the sales call was watching how I behave on a sales call. And I started to see how I did the exact things in a sales call in, in real life, like in my life outside of my business, how when confronted with discomfort, how I would behave, which would usually be going back to, interestingly enough, my education, my profession as a career to like have people try to take me seriously because of some unconscious beliefs I have around not being good enough. And so I, I remember she said, when will you stop? That was one of the like application questions. When will you stop? And my answer was, I will never stop. I will never stop. I will go forever. And then I remember I had a situation with my family in which my sister was very upset with me. And I thought, this might be where I stop. <laughs> I don't want to keep going. This is really hard. I'm unpacking emotions. I'm doing all of this work. And I, I just want to go back into the matrix, basically. Now that I've seen it, I don't like it. And I want to go back into it. Um, and so I do. I love that. And and you and I have chatted a lot about my uh, my other business in, in yoga teacher trainings and noticing also where I have done exactly that. Not necessarily like just not know to people and not been honest about how hard it will be because it was it wasn't always hard for me it was pretty easy at some points um but then i yeah. started to see yeah i would go into the teacher trainings so, um and so i was in the denver area when i first started modern yoga teacher okay. and um i would become friends with people that were in the yoga space that taught teacher trainings and when they found out what i did they would sometimes invite me to come in and talk to people that were about to graduate and, um, you know, I would come in and, and yeah, I, I would just, I was so excited. I was so happy, like to talk about it that I, you know, put it being a yoga teacher in such a joyous spirit and it, and it absolutely is, but I didn't talk about the shit. I didn't talk about the days when you don't want to do what you want to, like, you don't want to do it. And there's things that you have to do in order to get yourself into the right space that I'm going to be here. I'm not moving. I'm going to see this through. I'm going to make sure that it's successful. And it is stuff like working on your beliefs. It is stuff like developing the core values for your company. I don't care if it's just you and you're just starting out. If it is your intention to be a full-time yoga teacher, create some core values. How are you going to show up in your business? What is your business going to stand for? Because the thing is, is that if you have the intention of growth, you have to think about that beforehand. When you bring on an employee, you want to be, do you want to tell them this is the core values, this is what we stand for, so they can share that to the next person that they engage with. And you know, it's there's definitely some. It's not it's not freaking easy, y'all. It's not easy running a business, but that doesn't mean don't do it. Most of the things that are in life are really freaking hard. Have the the greatest reward afterwards. Because if you want to attract clients who are going to follow you and take your teachings and change their life, don't you have to be first willing to do that? Don't you have to first be willing to get out of your comfort zone and take direction and keep moving forward? But no, often people, they just want to sit back and like think about, oh, I'm going to teach at retreats and I'm going to make so many friends. I'm going to make so much money. But then you don't want to do the marketing you don't want to literally pick up the phone and make some make some things happen. You don't want to send out emails. Oh, I don't want to bother people with my emails. Listen, I am not calling anybody out because I'm calling myself out. I was the exact same way. Yeah. 
The only reason that I had maybe a greater procl proclivity, uh, procl blah, 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 whatever that word is, is because I came from a sales and marketing background. So it was easy for me once I let go of that resistance and all those beliefs that I had about the about sales and marketing to start incorporating into yoga. But the thing is, y'all, if this is something that's in your heart, if you feel called to do this, this path, it's your responsibility to do the hard work when it gets hard. And it is. It is. You know, and I was a runner and a quitter for most of my life. When things got really difficult, I'm out. Even though it caused me long-term suffering, I wanted that temporary relief. Whether it was getting out of a relationship, ending a friendship, quitting a job. I've taken two sales jobs where I took training, you know, from 9 to 12 in the morning. Then you come back from lunch and you get on the phones. I never came back from lunch. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there's de definitely been a few years where I had like four W-2s. You know, I mean, like I went from one thing to the next. So, you know, starting Modern Yoga Teacher was the first time that I put a line in the sand and I said, I'm not going to quit this. And for some of you, that might need to be what happens for you. And the reality is, is you're not going to have the support of everybody in your family. Your mom might think you're an idiot for doing this. Your dad, your partner. We're talking about the real, real here, okay? You might spend $3,000 to get a deposit on a retreat center and not book enough people. It's not going to be all rainbows and butterflies. Success often is not linear. And so I think the, the greatest gift that we can give each of you is just to talk about the problems and the stress and the mistakes that people make in order to get you into a mindset for the long run. Colleen, I'm going to grab a book. I want to read some, but go ahead, please. Yeah, I appreciate... I mean, it even brings us back to spiritual bypassing in which we can like do more and more instead of recognizing like, I do this a lot with emotions. I find emotions to be hard or difficult. So I'll do everything I can to not actually look at my emotions. And usually that's working harder. <laughs> so I'll do a bunch of stuff, but I won't actually do what needs to be done, which is often related to my my own stuff. So show us your book. I just kind of was like <laughs> off on a tangent around more spiritual bypassing. No, I mean the, uh, so let me talk to you about, this is actually a book that my former business coach wrote called want more and better clients. Read this book. Um, so number one, the five mental modes you need to win. Number one, make everything about the client and what they want. Zero prospective clients want your coaching, consulting, or services. They want the results your services are going to deliver them. What's the most popular radio station? WIIFM, what's in it for me? That's all the people that you talk to care about when you're speaking to them. They really, like, it, they're not selfish, they're not assholes, they're not, any, they're not a bad person. It's just a, it's a, it's a subconscious thing is what benefit am I going to get? What benefit am I, am I going to get from you being my teacher? So we have to think and talk in terms of benefits for them. Again, make everything about the client and what they want. Your shiny stuff is actually friction in the way of getting what they want. In fact, people only become clients because they believe you can help them get what they want. Um, this is something that I'm starting to really live by and Colleen is, is really going to embody this, uh, in the next few months is number two, the best way to demonstrate I can help clients is by actually helping them. One of my favorite marketers from, from, uh, is a man named Eben P Pagan. Eben came up with the idea called moving the free line. This was a contrarian idea that flew in the face of the common thinking at the time, which was to charge for everything and save your best stuff 
for your higher ticket coaching or consulting programs. Evan had the genius idea to go find your best content and give it away for free up front to dramatically reduce the amount of time it took to get an ice cold prospect to trust you enough to buy from you. The reality is there is more free information online, knowledge, wisdom than ever before. I don't think it's actually the knowledge. I don't think it's actually the information that is the most valuable. It's actually the accountability that you can provide as a coach that they actually follow through. When, when someone buys or when someone bought our mastermind program, in many ways they were buying my mistakes so that they didn't have to make themselves. And so when some of you like think about business coaching and you're like, oh my God, like 10 grand or 15 grand or what a five grand, whatever the coaching cost is, like, oh, that's such an expense. Oh. Every year, I either double, triple, or quadruple my revenue. And it, I can tell you the sole reason was because I, I worked with people smarter than me that helped me to advance. And the thing is, is that that's why it's so important. We'll, we'll have coaches for advancing our yoga career, you know, like our, our learning more as an actual teacher, but often we don't want to hire someone to advance us in our career to actually take what we just invested in that information and then learn how to be able to deliver it to more people. Why learn all this information, but you're not going to learn how to actually market it and get it out to more people so you can change more lives. All right. Um, that, there's a, there's Ryan rant number one or two. I can't count. <laughs> So. It reminds me of a story that I was told not too long ago about, I mean, maybe you've heard it, maybe not, uh, about a an airport that has a massive failure with their conveyor belt. And what happens is it starts to back up planes because they can't get the luggage out of the planes to, to the people. So now the airport's floor, full inside and out, and it's causing massive chaos. And so they're like, the, the employees can't fix it, but there's this one guy and he's an expert and they call him in and they say, you got to help us. We need you right now. And he says, okay, it's going to be like $10,000. And they're like, okay, it doesn't matter. Just what we'll pay, whatever, just do it. And he walks over to the luggage um, conveyor belt and he just changes one little screw. And then he comes back and says like, that'll be $10,000. And they go, that's not even fair. And he's like, that's not even fair. You're not paying for the hours that I put in. In this moment, you're paying for the hours I put into my education. You're paying for my mistakes. You're paying for the mentorship I've done with other conveyor belt luggage people. Like you're paying for what all these years that I've been a conveyor belt luggage guy, not just for what I did for you today, which then fixed the problem. Nobody else could do it. So I always think about that story because uh, I was afraid when I said yes to my coach the first time, she told me that her cost was 50,000 US dollars and I was a nurse and that was my basically like 80,000 uh, Canadian is what I made. So my yearly salary was what I would needed to invest to say yes to her and I it just it was crazy and I was in a crazy time. And I had about $10,000, which she gladly took as a down payment for this coaching program. Um, and it, within three months, as I mentioned the other day, I was bringing in $20,000 a month teaching in-person yoga. Wow. It was the, I, I mean, my family was against it. My partner was dead set against it. Everybody thought I was crazy, but it was just the, I just knew I needed to do this because I didn't learn how to run a business in school. But what I did learn was how to be a nurse. And then I took a lot of training and orientation in the hospitals that I work with in order to be able to do my job. So why wouldn't I invest that much money in my education around running a business in order to be successful with all this new knowledge I had just spent my money on? But I agree 100%.
And that that's what happens so many times is that yoga teachers, they're willing to invest to get more education in their in, in their practice, in their craft. And I think that's amazing. I think you should advance yourself. But if you want to grow your business, well, shouldn't you be in, ready to invest in that, in the education of that? You know, it really, it, it, it needs to go 50-50 in the sense of you need to be educating yourself and becoming a better teacher while at the same time learning how to get more clients. So again, you can reach more people with that wisdom. You can change more lives. Why, why get all that education for it to just sit inside of you and only be experienced by a few? And again, if you're waiting for the perfect time to teach, it will never come. It's not. Sterling says the time is always now. When's the time now? Yeah, but I think there's people, and I, I think there was probably me included that at, at one point where I was waiting for that. <clears throat> Let me say this, and I'm, I'm trying not to get emotional. There is not a moment where your teacher or someone you respect is going to come up to you and say, okay, you're ready. <laughs> you're ready to do it. I crown you as ready to go out and be a full-time teacher. Stop waiting for someone to crown you, crown yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I didn't come up with that. That was literally, I remember reading, uh, there was a guy, Josh Turner, who was a marketer who taught people how to get more clients through LinkedIn. And he was just like, no one's sitting on the sideline ready to, to crown you a, a, a an expert marketer. No one's ready to give you the title of whatever it is you're seeking. Crown yourself. You know, it's almost, I feel like sometimes we're waiting on the, the our guru, our teacher to tap us on the shoulder and say, okay, you're ready for that magic moment. And maybe those, maybe those are some moments for some people. But for most of us, we just need to step up. I understand if you're afraid to make mistakes, I get it, but you will learn so much more from making, from getting into action than sitting on the sideline, just, you know, like, oh, what if I do this? What? If, but I could do that. I could do this. You know, a lot of people we would work with students, they were resistant to figuring out or claiming their niche because they're like, oh, I don't know, like, uh, that's going to. I, 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 you know, I feel like that's going to alienate some people that I already work with. And the reality is it's going, you're going to have to cut some ties. You're going to have to cut some, like, if you need to declare to the world, this is what I'm passionate about teaching. There are going to be some people that are already in your path that are not, that are not in that vision. And that's okay. It's okay. You're not meant to be everyone's teacher. And, um, well, that's, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that I see yoga teachers make is not willing to, to declare a niche. And if they do, it's very broad. So, um, and, and as I've always said, you know, of course, after you get clear on your vision, you figure out your niche and then you figure out who you want to serve, who's your target audience. And, and on such a deep level. And this is something that, you know, Colin will be teaching, of course, is how to go deep on who your perfect client is. But we're not just talking about like, oh, yeah, I want somebody who is this and this and this. We're talking about the psychographics, the demographics. So like they're maybe between this age. This doesn't always apply to everything. But like there is someone, you know, maybe in this age group, because think about it. Let's say you're like me. I'm 45, just turned 45, which is officially old in my book. But I really, if I want to work with kind of a crowd, I would say maybe about 32 to about 55. That's kind of like my sweet spot. Why? Because someone who's 25 is probably not going to be mature enough to be able to take this information and then be able to run with it. And they're maybe not, they're, they haven't had enough life experiences to, to run their own business yet. I'm not saying that's everyone. And there's exceptions to the rule. But in the same way that if I was teaching yoga, that would probably be the same, same age range. I don't want to teach a four-year-old. I got no problems with four-year-old. We're cool. We're cool. But you're not my you're not my perfect client. You know, I don't want you running around like kindergarten cop, like, yeah. 
I don't, I, that's, so it's like honor who it is that you want to teach. And then like, there's even things of, is there a pr certain professions, you know, that, that you feel called to work with? And this is where you can start to really get deep. So, I mean, maybe it's, you know, yoga for nurses. And you're like, oh, my God, that's such a small percentage of the population. Yeah. But guess what? The more you specialize, the more you are sought out. The more broad you are, you actually don't speak to people deeply. But if you were to say, like, I work with uh, yoga for stressed out nurses or yoga for overworked nurses, yoga for um, ER nurses, like the reason that you want to, to, to be able to, to have a specialty is because what you're doing is, again, you're honoring what you love to teach. You're honoring who you love to serve. And the information that you're imparting to them is going to be more impactful because it's designed specifically for that. And now when you speak in your marketing, when you speak even just in conversations and passing, when you tell people what it is that you do, people know, oh, that's for me or it's not for me. And they can also refer people to you. You become like a lighthouse. Like, this is what I stand for. This is what I teach. This is what I'm great at. And people are like, oh, yeah, this is what she's great at. So next time they come in contact with a nurse who's stressed out, they're like, oh, yeah, I know a yoga teacher who specializes just in that. All right, R Ryan, rent number three. No, Colleen, please, please get me off, please. <laughs> I mean, I, I love this because I had a client one time. I said, all right, we gave them the homework, gave them a little sheet to fill out, like, who's your ideal client? And she arrives and she says, your homework is stupid. Like, my ideal client is a female in the, from the age of 18 all the way to a male in the age of 99. And I'm like, okay, that's really cute. And I appreciate that. And like, so what's that poster gonna look like? It's gonna speak to the 18 year old female and the 99 year old male to get them to come to your yoga class. Like that's not gonna work. And if you're not clear on who your ideal client is, cause they have a lot of yoga teachers that come and they want to enter like the, the, the world of eating disorders. Like they themselves have had eating disorders and they've used, used yoga to make their way through this. So if you are then offering yoga for eating disorders and you're trying to market to a 99 year old man that's never had an eating disorder, like how, how are you gonna speak to your client? So while I appreciate that you're trying to be inclusive, <laughs> it's actually not when you market to everyone, you market to no one. Because really, what is that poster? You know, remember, they still like do a lot of that here in Costa Rica. <laughs> the most popular form is Facebook. And the, of, of marketing is Facebook and posters. <laughs> Putting posters up in random coffee shops. Um, what would that post like flyers like? talking about flyers or, like oh, flyers was, yeah <laughs> yeah well that's the thing that also here in the united states i mean like it doesn't like i get at least that's something at least you're doing something but the reality is is that all, <laughs> i cannot tell so we of course have had a private group and you know um colleen just actually changed the name back to thriving yoga teachers which was was originally and you know we <clears throat> We've had so many people that try to post their retreat, their workshop in that, you know, in that group. And it's like, you're trying to just market it to often the people that, you know, yes, they'll be receptive to your message, though. They'll, they'll be, you know, and there might be one or two people. Yeah, there might be some people that are in terms of what you do. But by and large, it's like you need to go after an audience like and and. These are their common. So let's again, going back to mistakes often is what people will do is that they will go into private groups and they'll just blast it. And, you know, it's not always the right medium. It's not always the right group. It's not always the right timing. They even might say that there's no self promotion. And, but these are things that often yoga teachers fall back on because they don't know about marketing. They're doing what they, and there's nothing, I, again, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying you're, you know, it's just, that's not going to be efficient in the way to get your voice out there. It's not going to be a way for you to, to often get people to pack out your retreat, but that's what people know. They know flyers. They know these are the, these are kind of like the low hanging fruit that they can do, 
but it doesn't necessarily bring in the results that you're looking for. And so this is why you study marketing. This is why you, you start to learn how you can speak more directly to people. Have any of you actually ever, you know, watched a talk on Facebook or, or read an ad and you felt like the person was talking to you? That's because they've done their homework and they know who they want to serve. And so they speak more deeply. You know, and so I think really when you actually do, it, it might seem hard in the beginning to figure out your niche. It might seem hard to figure out who your perfect client is. But at the same time, it's really important to get clear on these things because I think it actually makes your path easier to go down one path versus teaching yin yoga and restorative yoga and like all these different types of yoga and trying to cater to different audiences, you're being pulled in so many different directions. But imagine if you were to say, I work with ER nurses, then you get to know what, because often we like to serve who we used to be. I did yoga for social anxiety because I used to have terrible social anxiety. So I wanted to serve people who were going through that because I knew how to get out of that naturally. So if you're working with an ER nurse because you used to be an ER nurse, you know what they went through. You know what their day to day is like. You can speak to their thoughts. You can speak to their feelings. You can speak to what will help them. You can speak to their pain. People don't care what you know until they feel like you care. Well, the way that you people feel like you care is actually speak to their thoughts, their pain, talk to what they're going through. Then like, oh my God, Colleen gets me. She knows what I'm going through. And your information becomes more valuable because there's a greater belief that they can go from their current state to ultimately where they want to be. And again, going back to what I shared earlier, people, that is the only reason that people will go into your retreat, your workshop, your coaching, because they believe they will go from where they are now to where they want to be, and you'll help them do that. So. I feel like that's a perfect mic drop. I, I think that was awesome. Well, we can end there. I mean, uh, again, y'all, Colleen has every bit of experience from being a yoga marketing business coach, being a yoga coach or yoga teacher and many different um, avenues and has made these mistakes in the same way that I have. And so there's no judgment in the way that we, there's no judgment here, judgment free zone. Um, but be you, be willing to be more of you. And um, yeah, we'll be doing another talk very soon. Um, again, Please give Colleen a warm welcome. She definitely deserves it. She's stepped up in a very big way. She wants to serve you all. And she truly believes that she can. And I don't want to speak for her. I'm just really proud of, you know, the, the way that she's really coming to this organization. And so just give her a warm welcome. Being here and sharing. Um, I love your tangents. I also do tangents, so <laughs> I can follow. <laughs> My ADHD sees your ADHD. <laughs> Anyways, thank you. And I look forward to chatting with you next week. All right. Bye, everybody.